what I feel we will head more and more into is a combination of two things. One thing is a change in our understanding and behavior of how the state is being used and using that to our advantage. And then I think another long-term thing that will happen, Lucas, is we will miss an aspect where we can be completely ourselves. I know social helps us express ourselves very, very well, but there are parts of us that we will not express due to this information being very in public, being monetized, being analyzed, and so on. Welcome to Lucas Scrobot Show. I'm Lucas Scrobot, and this is where we uncover purpose, pursue truth, and own the future. Today, we are joined by Iman Tani, who is a business growth specialist, but today we're going to be talking about business decline because we're talking about WhatsApp and their new privacy policies as they've changed it. They're going to be sharing their data with Facebook. So we brought Iman on the show. He's been on the show before to discuss exactly what is happening. Iman, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Lucas, good to see you again. Last time you and I spoke, I have remnants of uh, of lockdown and where where I was and where you were. So I'm happy that now things are a little bit uh, much much better than before. Well, your predictions before were quite accurate. You were saying, you know, this isn't going to be three months. This is going to be a total rehaul of society. I, I remember your takeaway point was, you know, act as if you lost your business and you have to restart today. How would you do that? And I think that advice proved to be pretty accurate. So I. I'm interested to see, as I said, you know, you're a a business growth specialist, but right now we might be seeing the implosion of WhatsApp. What, what is going on? I, I, what's happening? You've been on multiple interviews about this. So what are the, the actual facts? So, uh, what WhatsApp did was it communicated uh, a change to their uh, terms and conditions, which is not uncommon. Many apps do this. We usually quickly click accept and move on. But in this particular case, it had a statement that said, if by February, uh, the first week of February, you don't accept, you don't have access anymore to the service. Mm-hmm. So, it gave like 30 day notice to the service. And that raised alarms for users because you know, with WhatsApp, we have our pictures there, our messages there, our videos, our friends, family, coworkers, everybody's there. So uh, losing that very quickly uh, is something uh, alarming uh, there. So that uh, that could, that was a that was a significant contribution. Uh, another contributing factor is um, Apple and Facebook are currently going through a phase of disagreement on what user privacy means and advertising and targeting. So, uh, and what Apple changed in their app store description, they did this for all apps, not just only Facebook apps. For all apps, they added a segment within the app store that clearly indicates what user information uh, is any app using. And so Forbes and Wall Street Journal, what they did was they compared side by side Facebook Messenger with WhatsApp, with Telegram, with Signal and iMessage, and you'd get to see the amount of information there. So those combination of different things, Lucas, has caused uh, a lot of speculation in the media and social media and discussions on why why this is. And uh, what happened a couple of days ago, WhatsApp postponed their change until May to give them and the users more time to communicate on what has changed. So they did this in a way to, to give a breather for everybody that... We're going to talk more about what the changes are. We're going to talk more what they mean for you as a person or as a business using it as WhatsApp for business and so on. So this is this is what the status is today. So they've postponed it, but they haven't said they're not going to do it. And I think the biggest. Oh, it's going to happen, Lucas. (laughs) It won't change. Of course. (laughs) What what will likely change is just the more clarity and communication. They might factor in a few things here and there. But a lot of the things that they've spoken about, they were clear that this has been taking place before. We've, we've updated it. It's just an FYI sort of thing. And they're updating things related to future services with WhatsApp for Business. So I don't see a significant change of trajectory. I think it's more of a breather room for clearer communication uh, of what this means, which are great discussions that you and I are having now to raise more awareness about what this is and why and how and why should we care as people or why should we care as a business. So the biggest fear... I think I have personally, and most other people that I've talked to have is, are they going to be able to read my messages and are they going to be able to share the the data 
the macro data or the metadata from the things that I'm sending to my friends and family? Great point, Lucas. So um, let's talk about the messaging, the content of the messages. So let's say you and I are talking. Uh, what we're, what we're uh, uh, interacting and exchanging, that's encrypted, uh, end-to-end encrypted, meaning even if WhatsApp wanted to, or the employees or whoever in the middle wants to do this, this, this is encrypted. So if, I, if I'm messaging you or images or sending you my location and so on, all of that, uh, WhatsApp uh, and the Facebook family cannot see, or even if somebody's trying to attack that, of course, there are super advanced ways that are on a, on a much higher uh, movie level type of hacking into your phone. I'm sure there's a way around this, but from the day to day, all of this is encrypted. But what they have is what you refer to called metadata, which is information around this. So let's say one example is um, all of the contacts that you save in your device. So you usually save a phone number and a name and so on. That gets uploaded to WhatsApp servers. Uh, the reason being is when you want to communicate with somebody else, we do this based on their mobile number in WhatsApp. So that's a critical part of their functionality. And WhatsApp has clarified recently, uh, you know, in a much higher voice, that they don't exchange, they don't share this information with Facebook. So, but WhatsApp has this. Uh, uh, the second thing in terms of metadata is it has information on, um, let's say you and I are speaking. Do we speak frequent? So I have you in my address book, but are we speaking or not? Are we doing it frequently or not? Is it um, uh, is Ayman messaging an ex girlfriend after midnight, uh, uh, or is Ayman talking to Lucas during the day uh, on a work type of thing? Is Ayman messaging that ex girlfriend? Is she responding or not? Who does she speak with? Who does Lucas speak with? So all of that network of information that is the metadata. What are they? Ex- what what are they talking about? It's not there to be analyzed, but that information around it is huge enough for a better customization of the service and better advertising targeting, which means better ad revenue. And with AI technology, it, it's not like an individual has to go in and, and is going to be analyzing Iman's messages or my messages, which is it's actually almost scarier that AI is able to go in and just scrape and read all this data and essentially create a very by knowing a few data points can create a very accurate composite of who you are, your behaviors, and your actions based on who you're communicating to and the network that you're connected with. Uh, very valid, Lucas, because let's look at you and I. Uh, the way I would look at, okay, we're looking at an age bracket of 40 to 50, males, married, kids. Therefore, those uh, weekend messages of where we're hanging out, what are we doing, who's going where, we don't have that. It moved into a different uh, pattern uh, 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 than that. Uh, you and I like to create content and so on. So we have our own pattern of messaging and communication and consumption than somebody who's a little bit more uh, passive on that. Um, you and I have different interests when it comes to business or similarity and so on. And then they look at what are the Amens and Lucases in the other cities that are around them? What are they doing? What is similar? What is not? And because it's an immense amount of data, you have machine learning and AI and so on that is optimizing around it to better service the Amens and Lucases and to better uh, provide better targeting for advertisers. The target they want the Amens and Lucases, and will, and they're willing to pay to reach the Amens and Lucases, which creates higher revenue, obviously, for the Facebook family, which that's their biggest driver. So for Facebook's family, for Google's family, highly targeted advertising revenue in the billions is what the whole uh, free service that we use is about. Right at the end of the day, it is about more advertising dollars. But it's they're selling our data, they're selling our privacy. And Facebook does not have a very good track record when it comes to user data and user privacy. Um, they, they frequently skirt big governments um, for hearings. And it just seems I most of the people that I talk to have a high level of distrust that even when they say, oh, don't worry, we don't share this data. I think people distrust that to to a large extent. I mean, to the point where in in Europe, they created laws saying you can't store these data, the GPRD, Um, excuse me. Now, and with that, there's a lot of argument saying, well, this is being unfairly applied because these new terms of service do not apply to the EU, but they will apply to India. 
Um, so your question here has two or three different angles. So let, let's 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 tackle let's tackle one at a time. So um, when we say that they're uh, you know sharing our data, it's more of they're using the data. So it's not like uh, an advertiser can download. Uh, Lucas's information, Ayman's information, and, and has that in an Excel file that they can check all of that information. Um, what what the advertisers have is they can target people in a certain so they can target based on gender, age group, interests, behaviors, visitation, content consumed, and so on. So they can target um, an, an anonymized version of this. So from an ad, Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, they know they know who we are and what we do. But from an advertiser perspective. They don't know specifically that, but they're able to reach us. So the data in itself is not being sold directly. It's more of, let's say, monetized. So that right. that is being monetized with a layer of tools around it. This is one. Uh, two, from a distrust perspective, I understand the distrust is there, especially that there has been every year or so, there's a major thing related to something in Facebook and WhatsApp and Instagram from a either a policy or a security aspect and so on. And they they address it. They, they rush quickly to address it and then something else comes up and so on. So that distrust has been there. But what I've been seeing is that the Facebook family has been systematically adding more and more people onto their staff for addressing privacy and security and legal issues and policies and so on. And yet still, due to this huge dynamical change of the usage and behavior and new services and so on, a lot of a lot of this is catched up for them, and it's even more difficult for the legislators uh, who are trying to create laws like the GDPR and so on, in order to protect users' uh, uh, privacy and so on. So that definitely plays an aspect. And the third aspect, Lucas, to what you brought about is users. A lot of times, users say, "Oh, I'm leaving WhatsApp," and tell them, "What about Instagram? What about Facebook?" Like, no, check like them with the family. If you really are worried, would you leave all of them? They're like, I can't. It's like, I know you can't. So stop, you stop hypocrisy. I do this with my kids, right? I, you know, tell them do as I say, don't do as I do. Right. But yes, if you really want to, if you're really worried and you really want to make a stand, you've been you've been posting on this on social media. Uh, you know, shut down the whole thing for you. WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, and can you? Difficult. I mean, everyone can, but will you? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's I think that's a very important question, especially today when we're seeing big tech being able to deplatform world leaders, deplatform um, apps that they don't like, uh, communication platforms that they don't like. They say we can't have that conversation here, and then and then Amazon turns around and deplatforms uh, apps and the Apple Store and Google. So I think they're they're. What I'm seeing in the ether is that there there is a greater distrust of places like Facebook or Instagram because of their security, because of their control, because of their privacy. And we're seeing a huge, ex, maybe not an exodus from WhatsApp yet, but we're definitely seeing a huge um, influx to different apps like Telegram and Signal. I think, Lucas, if you want to do it, try it. Because uh, I personally go through phases, although I'm, I'm heavily entrenched in digital media, I consume it, I generate content on it. Uh, I, I've taught this at university level. Uh, I advise my customers about this. So I'm very well entrenched in it. Even I go through phases and say, what, you know what? It would be ideal if I can go back to one of my old Nokia, uh, you know, non-smartphones and disconnect for six months or a year. And, you know, I, I dream about this for a while. This is when we all dream about, you know, uh, going on vacation somewhere or spending time on an island and so on. But then, Look, I need to use my Google Maps. You know, I need to, there's a bunch of, I order food every day on this, my laundry, everything. Just, you know, I, we all of us use this very, you know, very commonly every day. So this, this uh, dream or, or, or you know, uh, inclination to completely disconnect for six months, a year, two or three is, I don't feel it's, it's doable, obviously, but I don't feel it's very practical. And I, even if I do it personally, I know that in a couple of years, I'm going to go back and then I'm going to have lost three years of worth of, understanding and um, connectedness somehow and so on to this, which which would definitely, definitely concern. Which brings us to the other practical thing of do we choose other apps, which is which is what your question was about. And this is where Telegram and Signal have had this huge influx of new users. Signal has had outages because of there's, you know, they've, they're built to grow, but not for such incidents. Uh, Telegram uh, uh, did indicate that within 72 hours, they've added more than 25 million users. And, uh, and, and and for me, all of this reminds me of, of, of the Coke Wars, if you remember those, Lucas. So 
Uh, Pepsi tried to rival uh, Coca-Cola. So Netflix have a great documentary about this. There are so many, uh, you know, uh, uh, videos and books and articles about this. So Pepsi wanted to rival Coca-Cola, and they're trying to. So Coca-Cola has a market share, and they're trying to, you know, bump uh, bump that up. So they had that for seven, eight years. They involved Madonna and Michael Jackson and a bunch of people around this, and so on. So Pepsi's dream was to get people to switch from Coca-Cola to, to Pepsi, and the Coke people are Coke people and the Pepsi are Pepsi people. So they say, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to try this. I don't want to try this. So they, they never try it. And hence the marketers struggle. What happened now from a telegram and signal perspective is they have their marketers dream where others are very open to trying the alternative. So they've downloaded these apps, they've opened it up, they've tried them, they talk about them and so on. So Pepsi would have loved for something like this to happen for people to switch in a day or to consider heavily uh, switching uh, uh, to, to, to Pepsi. Uh, uh, for this. And so this is the marketer's dream that happened for uh, Signal and uh, and Telegram. And they have all of these millions of users. Now, the trick is to get them to continue to engage there, to get the habit of them using them there, to get the education for them to stay there, and so on. So that's a, the that's a trick about this. So I see a lot of them adding Telegram or Signal to their messaging, but not dropping WhatsApp completely. But I mean, you have a, a very cynical, there's a couple of points that you hit on there. You have a very cynical look at, you know, well, it's like we're in this bad, abusive relationship and we're just stuck. It's like, well, you know, I can't leave. I, I I'm, I'm just going to come back. <laughs> I'm just going to come back to just allow my my data and my privacy to be sold to the highest advertiser. Now, yes, they provide a, a great service, but it doesn't seem like, you're giving people very many options. It's either you have to leave, which you're not going to actually leave. I mean, obviously there, there are people who have, who have left Twitter, who have left uh, Instagram, who have left Facebook, but it's few and far between. Um, is there, is there a way that people can actually push back on some of these legislations, some of these terms or conditions? Well, um, I wouldn't say I have a cynical view and we're in a bad relationship. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I spend a lot of time in these apps and I, I can't see myself without my consumption on Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp. And I've added TikTok to that repertoire and LinkedIn as well. So a lot of that is, and, uh, uh, is, is something that I consume on a regular daily basis. Uh, the cynical part that I have is I see there's a bit of a hypocrisy because, um, I can sense from you, Lucas, when you're talking to me that that the privacy aspect is dear to your heart, and it's it's and you're processing many things, and you want to raise more about awareness. So I, I I can sense we're talking with you on a genuine aspect of this. The cynical part I have is about many of the hypocrites that I see online who tell me I'm leaving WhatsApp or I, I don't I'll quit this, and it's I'm great if you want to do it right, go through the whole the whole thing, Instagram, uh, uh, you know, Instagram, and Facebook, and that's when they're like, no, 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 and those same people, Lucas. They talk to me about privacy and they post online about privacy and so on. And then they it's share hypocrisy. They share hypocrisy because they share everything about them, their kids, what they're eating, their clothes. They, they want to make sure I see their clothes, their, their cars, their vacations, their things, all of that. Well, like, so yeah, you're that same person who talks about privacy, yet you continue to feed these pipes because what Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of these are empty pipes that we feed. I'm okay feeding them, but I'm not okay with the hypocrisy aspect of it, saying that they're stealing things. Like, look, you, you've, you've posted your wedding and your things and uh, your key aspects. So you've fed that. Uh, you, you, you've fed that. So that the cynicism I have is for that for that aspect for sure. So yeah, I mean that hypocrisy, that double standard. It, it's it's very laughable. Um, at the same time, it it shows that these platforms have have become such an integrated part of today's society for most of the world or most of the the connected um tech, technology advanced world in that we there's parts of it we don't like but we want to still connect with our friends and our family we want to communicate to them in that digital world and the place that we do that is on these digital networks with the network effect and in order to keep these massive ships afloat, they need to make a profit somehow. And they're going to do that by selling advertisement to us. Um, definitely, there's a curiosity aspect to us as well. We got to see who's with, who's dating who, who's with who, and whose kids are better than my kids, and who's going to better schools. And there's, there's definitely that aspect of that. 
But the recommendation I continue to give is um, since these platforms take this information, they split them as much as they can and uh, to, for more people to see them and they're trying to monetize them and so on. I try to recommend uh, leveraging that. So to similar to what you do, Lucas. So what you're doing, Lucas, is you recognize this. You recognize there's a privacy aspect and so on. And you're using this information and this platform, these technologies to, but to get people to, to, to know more about you, about your interests, about things that you're passionate about, like privacy. You talk about your family, but within a very set aspect that you're comfortable sharing within that and so on. So you're leveraging that, you're using that to your advantage. And that's the recommendation I always have is saying, look, broadcast as much as you can things that are very important to you and your career and so on and stay away from the usual aspects that you will always upset somebody when you talk about religion, politics, uh, uh, sex, and, you know, things that are, no matter how you frame it and talk about it, you're going you're gonna to upset somebody. So talk about the other aspects about your work and career and interests and things that you watch and whatever you're passionate about to share. And that you can, you can push it all the way through. Because I've seen so many incidents, Lucas, of people who never had a chance for decent careers. When I say never had a chance is if you look at it from a narrow traditional perspective, they don't come from the right colleges. They don't come from the right societies. They, they don't have the right, their parents and families don't have the right connections to get them right, the right jobs. But they've embraced Twitter and Facebook and Instagram to build their own personal brands and so on. And they have so many job offers and collaborations opportunities that they would never have seen. And I've sensed that power with people so many times. And that's what I wish for others when they use these platforms. Absolutely. And it's a powerful thing that that the internet web 2.0 has given us social media connected platforms the network effect has given us the ability to connect with anyone anywhere in the world i mean we got connected on instagram and you mentioned how these platforms have enabled us to to connect and have lives that we thought that maybe we could never have to have opportunities that we could never have where we're able to start online businesses and and make a mon- uh, a living even from our home. You know, m- my wife, she she sells products online and she does it as a stay-at-home mom. And she does coaching and she sells coaching programs and and training with women all across the world from her home. So it's it's this amazing platform that she's been able to use to connect with people, but at the same time with with what's happening around the globe with big tech um, it's not just happening in America, but it's happening in Uganda. It's happening in India where, where people are being deplatformed, where the conversation is being controlled. Are we seeing th- the closure of 2.0 where, where web 2.0 was this, this free place where we're able to connect, right? You, you remember the, the late nineties chat rooms, ICQ, AOL, and it's just this open world of like, there are no gatekeepers, anything is possible. But now it seems, you know, this world that you painted that, you know, it doesn't matter what your background is, you could make it online. But is that window going to close as these big tech companies essentially are forced in some ways to control and censor more because they don't want to be held responsible. And will we begin to, are we seeing the beginning of a fracturing of these huge companies into something that might look more like signal that might be a new, uh, social media platform that's using something like, uh, blockchain technology to be able to connect people. Are, are we seeing those gatekeepers step in and will we see, uh, another open web, um, in the future? Um, your question is deep, Lucas, Very and deep. It, it, has a, it has a projection over, you know, decades of technology ahead. What I feel we will head more and more into is a combination of two things. One thing is a change in our understanding and behavior of how the state is being used and using that to our advantage. So I, I see that with... Um, younger generations that are coming up and discussions that I have with them about what they're sharing and how they're sharing. Not that they're more comfortable, but they are. That's their default. You and I have had pictures. We've had our youth in cases where there were either no pictures or maybe, you know, those standard physical pictures that I might have some back home with my parents' house. Nothing that's that can, you know, stalk me for decades and decades and so on. So they don't have that. So I think they're 
usage and behavior of this will have that in mind and it will become more socially acceptable for people to change in terms of they've had certain behaviors in the past that's digitized and for them to accept that, that they've changed and so on. So I think that is a long-term thing that will happen. And then I think another long-term thing that will happen, Lucas, is we will miss an aspect where we can be completely ourselves. I know social helps us express ourselves very, very well, but there are parts of us that we will not express due to this information being very in public, being monetized, being analyzed, and so on. So that aspect of uh, will move probably to have things that you really, really, really want to say with somebody very close to you, Lucas, in a behind closed doors, and probably you'd sw- turn on the switch that will cut off any broadcasting or recording material so that you can really talk one-on-one with your best friend the way you used to long before any of this, you know, that any of this won't come back uh, to haunt you. I think it's a combination of these two. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's what I'm seeing the way people are using these platforms like Signal or other secure messaging apps is that, you know, that's the way I use it. I, I, I'm i using Facebook Messenger. I'm using WhatsApp. But if I want to have a, a private conversation, whether it's with a business partner, whether it's sending secure information, um, whether it's banking information or whether it's sending, uh, you know, having a, an important conversation that mm, I really don't want big tech knowing that I'm talking about it, not because it's illegal, but it's just, this is privacy. I, this is what I want between me and my friends. I don't really care to have the whole world know. Amon, thank you so much for being here with us. And I, I think that that last, um, the two main points I heard you make was one was, Okay, figure out how to leverage it. You know, be careful with what you share on these platforms, but there is a still a wide open green field that you can do something with your business. You could do something with your life due to these platforms that you couldn't do before, due to this data that you couldn't do before. And then and then finally it was the the projection of the future, which is, well, we might just have to not share everything in a public way online and there'll be other digital platforms and channels where we can do so with privacy. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Lucas. Uh, you always have those thorough questions. Uh, and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you so, so much for being here.